The Old Testament lesson for the eighth Sunday of the Epiphany is taken from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 58, beginning at verse 5. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will shine forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your mere God. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. The epistle lesson for the day is taken from the Paul's... What did I just... Gradual? Oh, okay. Are you gradual at the, uh, on our Instagram? Will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, 
And unless your righteousness surpasses that of Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever woken up at night only to check the clock and realize that it's not actually nighttime anymore? It's just a couple minutes before your alarm. Now, I've unfortunately had this situation happen to me a number of times. And I can tell you it's very disappointing. <laughs> However, my disappointment in waking up to an alarm that's about to sound doesn't even compare to the disappointment and dissatisfaction that God had with the Israelites' practices in worship, as we read in our Old Testament lesson. Now, unlike many today who don't even bother worshiping God, the Israelites of the prophet Isaiah's day were in the practice of fasting, that is, refraining from eating in order to honor the Lord. But you see, God wasn't impressed with this. He said, On the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Now, Many of you maybe know that I went to a private Christian college, and at this school, the guys weren't allowed to the girls' dorms and vice versa, except for certain times on the weekends. So when do you suppose that the men decided to pick up all of our dirty socks and vacuum all the crumbs from our couches? That's right. Usually only hours before those perfumed visitors came and roamed our hallways. Now the rest of the time, it didn't bother us to live in the sweat and grime of collegiate bachelorhood. Our housekeeping routine, you see, could be called sporadic. That's what the Israelite worship practices were like. Many came to the temple as they fasted because they only wanted something from God. The rest of the time, they didn't give too much thought into the way God wanted them to live. Accordingly, God said, Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? You see, God didn't want his people to only clean up their act when it suited them. He wanted persistent, not sporadic <laughs> worship. Now, we too certainly can be guilty of this sporadic worship if we decide that the service is only worth attending on Christmas and Easter. But... Every Sunday churchgoers who say religion is the most important thing for me may also unknowingly be guilty of this practice as well. You see, God doesn't just want to have a part of our life as if he needs to compete with the internet for our attention or our bank account for our affection. Worshiping God is what we are to do with every fiber in our being all of the time. Now, I'm not suggesting that we just stay seated in the pews 24-7. Now, you could do that, and you still may be guilty of worshiping sporadically. The Apostle Paul explains what this persistent worship looks like in 1 Corinthians 10, where he states... So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Yes, it's okay for you to surf the net. But when you do, 
Ensure that all of the websites that you browse glorify God. And the same is true for the hymns that you sing here and the words of encouragement that you offer to your fellow members. Don't do it to simply draw attention to yourself, but do it so that you may help God by helping others. That was the problem in Isaiah's day. You see, the people weren't doing these things for God's glory, but instead to earn his favor. Isaiah reported, Why have we fasted? They say, and you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? Now the irony here is that God did notice their fasting. He noticed their hypocrisy. And I wonder, is that sometimes what God sees too when he observes our worship practices? Does he see us simply going through the motions when we come up to communion, for instance? Does he see people who think that being in church in the morning on Sunday means that God then owes them? Now, God says to Isaiah, Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right. You call this worship? No matter how good the singing is, no matter how big the offering may be, it's all rebellion if we don't persistently do this for God's glory. God went on to define how we give glory to Him in worship. As He says, Is not this the, the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and not to turn from your own flesh and blood. True worship, God explains, is not done by someone to just score points with God but it's done for others. Accordingly, the people of Isaiah's day should have spent far less time fasting and more time helping their neighbors. But instead, there were people running around without adequate clothing and food. And the so-called believers weren't doing anything about it. They weren't even caring for their own families, it says. These words hit me especially hard, particularly on Sunday. By the end of the day, I'm totally wiped out, and to be honest, I'd just rather sit on the couch and veg. It's easy for me to not see that there may still be other people on that day that need my help. I'd rather like to tell myself that eh, I've done my Christian duty for the day, I've preached my sermon three times over, and I've spoken to people about their thoughts and concerns and <clears throat> consoled them. What more would God want from me, I might think? He wants me to keep on worshiping Him by giving a hand wherever and whenever it's needed. But when I do, I often find that my actions are still tainted. In other words, I might get dinner ready, but that's because I want to eat. Or I'll fold my laundry simply because I need to move it off the couch so I have a place to sit and watch TV. You see, when I consider my actions, I can't help but cry out with the Apostle Paul. In Romans 7, where he says, What a wretched man that I am! Who will rescue me 
from this body of death. Thanks be to God that he has saved me and you through Jesus. God speaks of salvation in the next part of our text in Isaiah. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. A lot of people may think that it's a waste of time to come to worship on Sunday. Perhaps even a waste of time to continue that worship in serving others throughout the week. But you see, such worship is not futile. It's beneficial. God promises to go ahead and behind us. Just as he did as the Israelites left Egypt and they escaped through that watery hatch in the Red Sea. No, you're not going to fall behind on your work because you decided to stop and help someone. Just like you won't also be too exhausted after serving others. Just as God made sure that the sandals and the clothes of the Israelites didn't wear out during their 40 years as they journeyed to the promised land, he will also see to it that you don't wear out either. But best of all, God says that you will shine with righteousness. <clears throat> I know. But we know that this righteousness cannot be our own, as I just got done describing the fact that we still serve as we're tainted with sin. We will, though, shine with righteousness because of Jesus. You see, Jesus was always consistent in his worship, never sporadic. And what does this have to do with you? Jesus did it all for you. When large ships come to a foreign harbor, they'll usually take on a harbor pirate. And this is someone who knows the ins and outs of a particular harbor so well that they're able to steer the ship safely into the port. That's what Jesus does for you. He is your pilot, so give him the controls. He'll safely deliver you to the mansions in heaven. He not only knows the way, he's also taken the penalty for any wrong turns that we take on the way there. So, brothers and sisters, although sleep, subpar sleep for that, may be disappointing at times, subpar worship is a disaster. Those who don't take to heart God's words here and ignore them shouldn't be surprised if God ignores them when they ask for help. But why would we want to ignore God's word and what he has to say to us today? Why would we not want to worship him with all of our being based on what he's done for us? He saved us from hell and promised us heaven. And so we know that he is beyond worship, worthy of our worship and all of our persistence as we have it assured to us and he will deliver us to a place where that worship is made perfect in paradise. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.